Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the noticing. Yeah. Um, is that like our first hint of like, we're going to be evolving into the, uh, the metaverse? I'm sure oh. you, <laughs> I'm sure you yeah. saw. Yeah. Under that? meta. Yeah. Under, under meta. Under meta. Meta alphabet. I wonder what uh, Apple will, will uh, transform into. They were Apple computer, which then became Apple, but that's sufficient. Oh, okay. that, yeah. uh, Maybe they'll become orange, orange alphabet meta. Maybe they'll just change up their language so we can't uh, we can't pick on them, you know. So you can't like land anything really hard. It's like oh, oh that's Alphabet's issue. That's not Google's issue. Right. Google's that's, not the issue. Alphabet's the issue. Right. That's that's part of the uh, the trickery of it. And yeah, Mazel Tov, because I knew that was you know I know I know that's where you wanted humanity to head it was uh, <laughs> more towards the the metaverse. So <laughs> yeah. yesterday's announcement was <laughs> apropos. <laughs> Uh, someone put together like a 30 second you know we we've done episodes before on like experienced someone put together like a 30 second clip of him just saying like experience 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 like you, you said it you must have said it 50 times yep. yesterday's announcement it's like but are those experiences are those the, yeah that's an interesting philosophical question there yes yes yeah are those experiences that is that's a good one so well that's for uh, what would that be called though? I think that's um, uh, that probably uh, uh, will fall into the re you know reality realm, uh, the fitness expression realm, um, the uh, uh, epistemology. Like was there was there learning? You know, uh, yeah, that lands in a lot of areas. Was yeah. was there some knowing that came from it or? wisdom gleamed from it yeah. can you have a fitness experience in the digital realm i mean right now like the digital stuff that people are hooked up to are still you know it's still a bike ride but it's got a digital screen or it's still a tonal and like you're still working against forces but what do you do when it's um you know a digital simulacra and that's what's feeding the neural input and yeah so yeah yeah um well, we're gonna we're gonna pause on that arena that I am like I'm like a you know a dog seeing a treat when you mention things like that, um, which if you don't know what happens, they're quite happy and they'll do whatever it takes to basically <laughs> get that treat. So that's where I sit in regards to that uh, virtual concept that of tying in the physical expression with the virtual concept. Um, I always, of course, land on, and here I go, I'm always going to land on uh, uh, the intentions inside of it, um, of how, you know, where the intentions need to go prior to that, like virtual experience, that's going to lead to some positive outcomes, but we shall not. Um, today, we're going to chat about uh, evolution and fitness, and uh, I'll cue this one up um, by saying, well, uh, welcome. I'm James Fitzgerald. Uh, this is Robbie Gustin. Gustin? Hi there, everyone. Or Gustin? Gustin. Gustin. Like Gus. Yeah, like Gus. But but Gus Tin. Gus Tin. How many people stick on the T around you? I don't know. I never thought about it. I, yeah. I'm, I'm going to listen closely from now on when people uh, say your last name. Gustin or Gustin. I'm just usually listening out for like Goostin or something like that. Or... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there some Goostins? Not that I'm like aware people of. say it? Okay. Now, there, there are people who say it, but... Okay, yeah. but they don't exist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> or I don't know. I mean, there might be someone with the same line. Do you know, have you ever seen or heard of the uh, the TV show, The Flash? Uh, I know of the superhero Flash, The Flash. Yeah. So, yeah. There's like a TV show and the, the guy who plays the flash, uh, Barry Allen is named Grant, Grant Gustin. Oh, so, okay. So I, I don't, I, yeah, I don't, okay. I don't know of anyone who has that last name. Where it's well, I mean, if it's Gustin in Hollywood, that's, that's the, that's how you pronounce it. Yeah. That's the right. check mark right there. Uh, -huh. uh, the blue check mark. Um, welcome to fitness and philosophy today. We're going to uh, talk about evolution and fitness. Um, a preamble that was this is not re, re, this wasn't recorded 
but uh, we agreed that uh, we're going to try to be masterful in such a large topic. Um, we're going to try to cover all the big pieces of it, the basic pieces of it in one conversation today. And uh, we thought we'd go about it in a manner that, you know, teaches, you know, just enough uh, to whet our appetite on evolution. And when we say that, what are we actually entering into and how it ties into, secondly, um, uh, Robbie's uh, expertise on tying in a philosophical, you know, concept and how you can go about thinking of it. And then it's kind of like the, where all of us come together, the topic, you and me in the fitness, you know, component, like how do we fit this in? And we're probably going to um, discuss it in a manner that's helpful to coaches. And then if you're just a participant in fitness, uh, you may be able to get an insight as to the way we think about the approach to that and what, you know, how we look at what we do every day and uh, just not forget that time honored you know, uh, tradition of uh, asking those questions. So what happened? What happened back then and got us to this point? Yeah, absolutely. Very, very well said. And I, I yeah, that, um, that's pretty good up. intro. That's pretty good. I, intro. Would, I would say so. I, would I think say I that. might take over intros from now on. I think that was pretty good. You, not that you yours are that. not good, but I just thought that was pretty good myself. I would agree with that. All right. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. Okay. So I guess with that in mind, um, let's talk about it. So just like James said, there, there are three main areas we're going to cover today. And, you know, th it's, it's such a huge topic. So we really are going to try to whittle it down. So if you're thinking there are other things to touch on, I'm sure we'll get to them at some point uh, in future episodes. But as far as the intro goes, we're going to talk about uh, three main things uh, to start us off. One is basics about evolution. Uh, number two, some philosophy connections. And then number three would be um, those bigger questions that we want to discuss between evolution and fitness. So to put it in the most basic form, I think most people understand the basics behind evolution, but a pretty good definition is the process by which different kinds of living organisms are thought to have developed and diversified from earlier forms during the history of the earth. So we speak colloquially of you know, our thought evolving or, you know, of Apple's designs with their products evolving. And of course, those terms are fine to apply there. But what we're really talking about here um, is biological evolution. Biological human yes. evolution. Yeah. And specifically, very specifically human as far as it regards to um, fitness. So why is evolution important? Well, there's the famous uh, Theodosius Dobzhansky quote, um, nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolution. To, you know, prior to Darwin coming along, the standard explanation, at least in the Western world, was some form of, um, you know, creationism of one sort or another to explain the diversity of life, uh, to explain how organisms worked. And then, um, you know, there's still things even today being worked out in evolutionary theory, but as far as explanatory power, um, there's not a close second for evolution. So why is this relevant for what we're discussing in, in fitness and nutrition and, you know, broader uh, conversations about health? If we're talking about the health of biological entities like humans, the conversation can't even really get started without referencing evolution. And I I personally say this routinely in, in nutrition conversations, there can be all sorts of ethical concerns, environmental concerns, religious, cultural, all these different things. And it's not to negate or to say that those are unimportant. But if you are talking about the health of the biological organism, the human, I don't even know what conversation you're having if you're not, at least in some way or another, referencing evolution. Yeah. It, it needs to be part of the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Because we're essentially talking about resilience and adaptation and you know and then you have to say well what are we actually talking about we're not talking about the words we're talking about how those particular things are have been over time um connected to homo sapiens like how how has that occurred right exactly and like when people say oh you know uh i mean this is just one example, but oh, paleo is one among, among a number of you know fad diets, and then, you know there's vegan and there's keto and there's carnivore and there's macros. It's like, no, 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 no. Uh, like when we're talking about the health of the human organism, yeah. and like 
if you are not making some reference to our evolutionary history, again, I don't even know what is being discussed. And it's kind of the same thing with fitness too. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why we don't do more spoofs on why, why other in other systems or in other areas, people are like, don't make fun of pens or guns <laughs> the way, oh, guns are, that gun is just a, it's a new trend. It's like, right. <laughs> no, actually like, you know, do your research on, uh, the Spanish Inquisition, <laughs> it's like, you know, uh, certainly, I know, sorry, maybe guns not the right way to go, but you know what I'm saying? But in nutrition, yeah. it seems like we get, we get, we get, uh, bam, you know, slammed on it. It's like, oh, that's just fad. It's like, gosh, I don't know how to get my way out of that now. If you perceive it to be a fad. Well, that's where equivocation about terms comes about. If we're talking yeah. about the actual thing called the paleo diet, you know, Michael and Mary Eads and yeah, you know, no. Bourdain and Rob Wolf, like yeah. if that's what they're, okay, well, that's, that's a recent development, although not a fad. Now, if we're talking about yeah. that actual way of eating yeah. of humans, that's, yeah. So I think but that's, that's good because that's clarifications. Like what were, what were people using uh, to protect their homes, you know, a uh, thousand years ago? And uh, so, so let's say it a different way. What were people sourcing from the environment to use as energy 3000 years ago? Right. You know, so, so, so see, I just said the same thing, but I didn't say it in a language that was going to make you get triggered based upon it being a fat diet. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And that, and that, I mean, going back to something we were saying before the call started, I mean, this is an important thing. Like how do we couch these things when we're discussing them? Yes. So it's not like the hot button yes. uh, thing. So why is evolutionary theory so powerful? Um, when we, when we talk about philosophy of science, again, super huge topic, just going to whittle it down to the most important thing I think you really need to know when it comes to evolution. It is able to explain and predict the diversity, complexity, and adaptation of life better than any other theory. So um, what makes a scientific theory powerful is its ability, and by the way, theory, again, colloquially, we use it as like hypothesis or guess. It does not mean that. It means a systematic framework of evidence and propositions and, and things of that nature that can explain on the one hand, what does it mean to explain? It means to you know, take some phenomena in the world that maybe we don't understand how it works and then give a reason why it works. But then even more importantly, like Einstein and um, you know, uh, the Eddington, uh, experiment after, I believe it was, uh, it was either, yeah, it was, it was in the early 1900s where he predicted that light would bend in a certain way, uh, when observed from a telescope and like, that's my, that's, blowing. yeah, that's, that's the thing, you know, compare it to, you know, the fortune tellers who are like, well, you are a person and you had a grandparent, like, no, what, what makes scientific theories powerful is no, they're going to call their shot. Yeah. They're going to say, I predict this specific thing will happen. Mm -hmm. And if it happens, that's further confirmation. And if it doesn't, the theory needs to be revised. Yes. Yeah. So I think an interesting, sorry, not to sideline, but just people, oh, no, to, please. people to double click on it. You can go and search. I think uh, searching out Galileo's history and the concepts proposed and like coming up with those things is a really, what will like, really hard double click on your point there of creating theories and then like, you know, mind blowing stuff, stuff that's like, no, it's not possible. It's, <laughs> it's not possible. Right. And uh, when it comes to light, it, it will explain in much more detail your point there. Yeah, absolutely. And when we talk about this in the health and fitness realm, I mean, I, I listed a few here, but gosh, I could list, I mean, we both could list probably a hundred or 200 of these things. Like, you have these isolated data points. Oh, why is barefoot running and walking generally better? Hey, why is it that blue light blockers make any difference to sleep and melatonin production? Paleo eating. Why is breastfeeding better? If possible, you know, natural birth, if possible. Why, why does a squatty potty make any difference? Uh, you know, light and dark cycles, benefits of walking, like we go through, you know, antibiotics, we could go through a hundred of these different things. If you don't have an evolutionary framework, you're stuck with this explanation over here and this explanation over here. And these data points aren't united in any sort of systematic way, but you can explain these and so many others with reference to our evolutionary history. Yes. 
I would add some, uh, for those of you who want to be uh, healthily, uh, mentally challenged is to keep going on Robbie's examples just given there. And uh, personally, the ones that I've grown the most is in the areas of that particular area on uh, mating, um, uh, um, uh, psychological temperaments, uh, evolutionary psychology. Um, those are areas that I've really grown myself the most by getting into those, you know, particular ones that you just mentioned there and just like adding to the list. So just as a side note for those who want to really like, you know, just open your mind to, you know, uh, mate choice and, and sexual temperament and things like that. That's a really great growing point. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, I think that's an excellent point because it gets to one of the deep philosophical questions uh, within philosophy about biology and evolution, which is how much explanatory does it have? How much explanatory power does it have? Does it extend to everything? Does it extend yeah. to art and culture and literature? Um, does it extend to psychology? Is it just to, you know, the biological aspects of ourselves, if we can even like siphon those off yes. aside from the psychological. So yeah, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And I would, uh, I'd keep going on that to say that from those who I really respect that discuss that they say that um, it's more about how much of a how much of a recognition you have of the current culture as well as how much you believe in team play of all of those things that largely dictates you know how important it is and I think the what commonly happens currently to today is you know you know culture manifest as being the answer to all those things Whereas they're, they're just like, well, slow the horses here. We're not going to say that evolution will explain all these things. We're just saying that we do want to like include it as a teammate <laughs> in the way we go about finding the answers to these things, if that makes sense. So it should be like a partner, a partnership with how you see the world and how we're, we're doing today, you know, because I mean, we don't need to get into it, but there's some darker stories to using evolutionary things as a base support, you know, right. and uh, there's some dark areas you'll get into if you don't like partner up with current cultural understanding of how people see these things and how they navigate. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a great way to, to talk about it and think about it. And we'll, we'll get to that with fitness as well, but this idea yeah. that it can, um, it can be a good generator of hypotheses within specific fields it can shine a light on certain things that might seem inherently um, mysterious at first, if you just take a purely cultural lens. Yeah, like why uh, high bar back squat? <laughs> why the high bar back squat? Exactly. We always go there. <laughs> why I do back this squat just for. <laughs> oh what are man! Doing? I do. I do this because I know in the ether there's someone picking that up and like moving FIP up the leaderboard every time I like hit, yeah. the, hit these moments, you know? Every time we shit on barbell back squat, it you know, <laughs> takes us up 20, 20 notches. <laughs> we, we went to, just with that comment, we yeah. went to number 27 out of 70 on the world world's best uh, fitness podcasts. Not because they like the content of that idea, but because they're so incensed by it that they're sending it to everyone. And now, oh, for sure, for sure. It. Did you hear this? Did you? Yeah, it's like a retweet. I just, yeah, I just indirectly retweeted. Oh man, I. You know what? Just complete <laughs> aside, but related to this, uh, I should just uh, instead of evolution and fitness part one, I should just call this like the barbell back squat is shitty, like the title of the, <laughs> of the podcast episode, <laughs> and then just see. <laughs> I'm going to do something more. <laughs> See how many views and likes. I'm going to recommend that every podcast here forward has just like the shittiest triggering line in the whole thing. That's the title. And then we're just waiting for them, for everyone to get to it. And somehow through it, they may, they may get something. They may learn something. Yeah. Yeah. Did I the think end, they talked the about epistemology the there at one point, but all I heard was lunges are going to mess you up. And that's what I... That's what I got. Um, Maybe we make it an experiment for a season and see how it goes. There's multiple. Listen, <laughs> I dream little dreams like that of like the the uh, the five different versions that go on uh, underneath the FIP overall. And by the way, just to retort, this is evolution and fitness. Period. There's no part two. We will we will discover all the answers 
today. We will definitively answer all the questions. There will Continue. be nothing left. Continue, yeah. wise one. So just a brief uh, discussion on philosophy and its relation to evolution, very, very brief, but just to give you a sense of why evolution is discussed a lot in, in philosophy, um, you know, there's, there's philosophy of science and then there's philosophy of biology and there's all these interesting questions regarding um, evolution and biology, like is biology reducible to physics? Um, how can we best explain the concept of fitness? That's something we might... Uh, no, we will get to and we will answer today. Um, you know, is who we are reducible to genetics? Um, and then there are, you know, the, these timeless philosophical questions that, you know, everyone's asked about who we are, where did we come from? Where are we going? Where does morality come from? That when you have such a powerful thing that, you know, you and I are always fond of talking about, like, what was life like back a thousand years ago? Like, for all of human history, no one had this as a reference point. And now, like, you know, 150 or so years later, like we're the first humans in history to really have this kind of framework to try and explain and understand like, who are we? You know, descendants of, uh, you know, primordial organisms. And what does that mean for who we are? And that's, that's a very different way of looking at the world and mm -hmm. what is our place in it? Is, is there meaning to that? So uh, philosophy has a really deep connection to, um, evolution and biology in these these evolutionary um, uh, discussions. Yes. Okay, so what about fitness? Um, what about fitness? What about fitness? What about this thing? Um, I think one of the most interesting questions we can ask, and you know, James, I didn't know if there was one of these that kind of struck you more than others, but I think one of the most interesting ones is the first one, which is, you know, options for evolution's relationship to fitness. And the question here is, how do we, how do we think of evolution's relationship to fitness? So option one is really just a, a non-starter, right? No relationship whatsoever, wholly unrelated. Maybe before evolution came along, people thought this, but it clearly has something to do with it and probably quite a bit. Um, option two, uh, which I'll put my cards on the table, I'm a bit more of a fan of, it's a unifying framework, a guiding light, an important generator of hypotheses, but not the end all be all, right? We, as humans, we explore different things. We explore, you know, tow and surfing and snowboarding and biking and gymnastics. Um, you know, evolution is a key component of biology, but we're not purely biological beings or if culture is ultimately reducible to biology, no one's really given a good account of that just yet. So we, we still have to wait on that one. So there's still culture mixed in uh, is there a way culture can extend any of our fitness practices virtually beyond our evolutionary past? And then option three would be something like evolution is the way, the light, and the truth of everything pertaining to health and fitness. Um, the back squat should not be done because it makes no sense from an evolutionary perspective. Um, something to that effect. Um, so yeah, I guess that's a that's a good place to start. Any any thoughts there? Yeah, well, I first uh, thought about how I see it. Um in uh the uh evolution's relationship to fitness i first go to uh movement and i think of um movement in multiple different ways you know and i keep thinking about um how uh you know we we moved to uh get across land and we moved to do day-to-day -day activities and uh we did those particular movements um, possibly, you know, a long time ago, because we just learned over time that those particular things, and I'll give you two examples of, you know, uh, locomotion across land or moving, um, as well as, which is of course connected to, uh, sourcing foods and sourcing, you know, places to live and et cetera, um, as well as moving every day, I eat labor, you know, foraging for foods, hunting, et cetera. Um, I do believe that at that period of time, we learned over time that if we that if what we were doing there, which was wasn't called movement, but it was movement, it resulted in us, you know, um, essentially having all those things in front of us, which is other humans, um, maybe some contentment, you know, conversation around a fire, um, you know, 
uh, this, you know, initial practices of reciprocity, reciprocity and altruism, um, and, and essentially, you know, reproducing and surviving, surviving this thing, whatever we're doing. And so that, that's what I, that's the way I think about it is that you go back in time. And that's why I use the, the humorous example to try to tie into current, to current states of movement is that uh, it seems, it seems funny, right? It, it's, it's humorous at times to, to look at um, the focus and intent on a leg press, you know, um, where you just start to think about, you know, what happens if there was nothing ever called a leg press and what happens if, if it was still like a squat position that they held for, you know, 15 minutes, right? Uh, was it a squat position? Well, <laughs> maybe it wasn't, maybe that's what they did. So that's, but, I'm, but see the leg press and the squat position that that person held in foraging were, were mo is movement. So I think the movement thing is the, is kind of almost too, Robbie, the, the, the uh, in my opinion, a safe area to go. A safe area, also an emotional area, and that's why I like to use it because uh, it makes it makes me uh, as as my role as an educator. It allows people to tie in what unifies this entire thing. It's still movement, right? Like, and then what? Ha and then, of course, which we can uh, discuss lower order to higher order concepts of that. What happens when you don't move? But that's where I go for its relationship. To add to your points of uh, seeing things in different ways. Okay, and I, I mean, I take it you intend uh, the evolutionary framework and you know this movement framework of higher and lower order movement to be a means of assessing, yeah. not just like noticing. It's it's not just the historical judgment like oh we didn't used to have leg presses but now we do. It's the oh there's there's a further judgment or uh, assessment about like mm, should we be doing those or should should those be part of our fitness practices yeah it allows us to look like <clears throat> i mentioned earlier of how <clears throat> great minds and evolutionary concepts say you know that you have to take into consideration culture and in culture is this like is uh, i don't know how to put it correctly but it's uh it's software that we really have to remember it's super important like it's the software that gets around us and and it's really really important and so uh that's why I say, you know, the leg press is still movement is, is why I choose it. Cause it's, you know, it's not like you can, well, I guess some can argue that, argue that, but it's, to me, it's, it is that, you know? Yeah. So I love oh. the movement aspect. Um, I think of, I think of, uh, you know, I come up with these, uh, what I call them fitness fables. <clears throat> I've written some of them, but I come up with a lot of them in my head. They never make it to paper or, or um, or uh, words on a membership site. Uh, I really need to improve my typing skills, but I just, I just sit back and think of uh, these. You know, I try to I try to get into that that Homo sapiens, um, you know, body. When you know, I just envision these times of I visited north of Flagstaff, um, and there was this old maybe it's like uh, maybe a thousand years old this play area where you know, humans used to uh, gather in a tribe and uh, they built this little town, you know, and it's uh, deep down in the rocks and whatever. And there was this huge round field. And I just read the, you know, area, what was on there is like, <clears throat> it was for games. And they used to come up with these games, you know, to play in that field. And uh, I took a couple of moments, right, to just be by myself and, and like try to, you know, you can visualize looking out there and get inside of one of their bodies at that time, right? That long ago and start thinking about like, well, what is happening? Like, what are we doing? You know, what are we actually doing in this? And that's why, you know, uh, right next to this concept of movement's been around the whole time is uh, our, my aha moments is that movement, movement, uh, and that's why I'm a little bit more harsher on the leg press as an example, but movement was done for, you know, a connection to yourself, like what you're capable of, and an also an opportunity to be creatively expressive, you know, expression of human movement, you know. Um, and uh, anyways, I just think about those things as these, you know, fables, you know, come up with storylines of what would happen in that case. Um, and I, I just, the reason why I'm mentioning that is that 
it adds in another component to why I love to have movement as the relationship to fitness in an evolutionary sense. Yeah. Because of the expression and creativity aspect for humans. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, and that, that gets back to something, you know, we've discussed and something I've, I've been wondering myself about. Um, I don't know if you heard about this show on HBO. It was called the hundred foot wave. Um, yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, very good mini series, but anyway, it was basically it was about uh, this big wave surfer named uh, Garrett McNamara, yeah, who uh, found a place in Portugal called uh, Nazaré, where you know biggest biggest waves on the planet. But anyway, in 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 the course of the mini series, they talk about you know the history of surfing and the history of like hey you know some dude takes out like a wooden board in the middle of the ocean and starts to paddle, and then um, we get fiberglass and wax, and then wasn't even until 20 years ago um, that we get the jet skis didn't even have the capability to do toe-in surfing. And going back to what you were talking about, like with creative expression, like, you know, if you watch any one of these guys talk about the experience they have doing something like this, uh, which is just about as far from any evolutionary like sets of movements you could do as possible. Um, yeah, I, I think about I think about things like that and other things when I think about to what extent are our human movement patterns constrained or calcified by like what happened pre ten thousand years ago and like yeah. those are the legitimate ones versus no I mean humans have been you know to put it crudely like dicking around you know handstands and all sorts of stuff yeah. for for a very long time and. Um, it, 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 to me, I, I, I think that's just a very interesting question. Like what room is there for creativity and, and, and yeah. freedom that goes beyond, uh, you know, uh, snowboarding, I mean, yeah. for example, um, that goes beyond anything that would even remotely resemble something evolutionary. It, it has a tie, but yeah. man, you really got to trace it back to, to get that tie. So I don't know if you have thoughts there. Oh, for sure. No, I just, I just love the conversation. Like I think about the technological advances that allow people to seemingly think that they're experiencing movement. That's good. They think they are right. But so, and I don't think we're going to land on an, you know, an absolute, let's say judgment of what is right and what is wrong in that expression. But I, I just thought, you know, we've been doing handstands probably for, you know, since the, the gymnasium, you know, back in Greek times, um, but we sure shit weren't doing 50 kipping handstand pushups on a hard floor. You know, so what, what was the technology and the creativity that allowed us to do what I would call, you know, in some cases, and I just pick on that one, but stupid shit, stupid shit, evolutionary for the physical, you know, ability. And you could, you could air into like a machine that pulls someone up to this huge wave that they have no business getting on. You know, saying it's like, well, how'd you get there? Well, it's new technology that allows me to go and ride it. You know, and, and it, it's fascinating. And does it lead to like a peyote or ayahuasca kind of concept, you know, you know, experimentation of that? I can tell you 50 handstand push-ups on a hard surface doesn't, you know, it actually right. moves you further away from that. I digress. But uh, that's right. I start thinking about those things for for it. And I'm I'm I gotta be bi I'm biased, you know. I'm definitely have as I've aged become more of a purist towards just erring on the side of caution of those technological things that you think are adding to what's called let's call it a better human expressive movement experience i just i'm just a little bit more cautious to to what those are um for a host of other reasons uh, but um yeah so one i think would be interesting to discuss there because mm -hmm. you know I, I can see the point there with uh i mean toe and surfing is kind of an extreme example and those are like the best of the best and most yeah. Yeah. normal people aren't ever going to be doing that Snowboarding, yeah. you know, that might be a bit more of a, a middle ground with where a lot of people do it and enjoy it and, you know, get out of nature and, and breathe, but we could use that. Or, I mean, one that I think is interesting, especially in relation to the barbell back squat discussion, uh, you know, biking. Yeah. Um, well, I like, I like, I like where you were going actually, cause I have, uh, you know, concepts for people to think about of, uh, you know, we don't, we, again, this is this balance of, of the importance of evolution and biology in the context of how we see culture play out for movement experience. This is, this is why you gotta, you gotta hold both opinions in your hand at the same time to have a conversation of it is the, the snowboarding example, right? Like, you know, people are like, oh, it's, 
you know, some may say, oh, it's the fucking greatest thing. You fucking come up with this, down the fucking thing, sun on the water is like, oh, fuck, put it on the... Um, but you need you need to go back. And so let's just say the evolution of going up a mountain and then coming down on skis, there was never lifts, L-I-F-T-S, right? So you talk to the purists, um, you can read Mark Twight's story, which would be more, uh, I guess, culturally... Uh, tied into us in North America and et cetera. Um, I forget uh, what the name of the book was that Mark wrote. Um, anyways, it's about alpinists and climbing, right? So, but my, I'm going to get to <laughs> stay with me here is that using your example of snowboarding, we just have to appreciate the fact that you're getting on a technologically advanced thing to get up to come down and somehow biologically, physically maintain your ability to get around and do what you need to do, the eccentric contractions, et cetera. But just remember, it's important you remember the evolution of how this practice came to be, right? You got to remember that, that at one point in time, for example, the purists in skiing will tell you like they're using these telemark skis. Why? Because that's how what gets them to the top of the mountain such that now they can traverse back down the mountain <laughs> and like, oh yeah, right. There was one time where, so you see what's inside of it. People are like, oh yeah, okay, get up the mountain, get up the mountain. Do you know how much practice and fucking work and correct timing and strategy and everything that's needed? And my point is that the, tr the strategy and the skills and the practice and the five years it takes to build the capacity and everything to get up the mountain, ironically, it creates a preservation of biology for the down. So think about the think about these classic young whippersnapper. And listen, I'm biased here and I'm pissed because of electric bikes. I'm not gonna lie to you, right? I see them zooming up the hill and I'm like fucking dying, right? Pinned at 182 beats per minute. But these young whippersnappers get these expensive $12,000 bikes and they get on the ski hill lift and they go up and they bomb down, right? And whole time in my mind, of course, I'm thinking in an evolutionary lens, what happens if they never build the strength to actually get up the mountain? And guess what it results in? It results in their mental acuity being off, capacity therefore limited, and guess what happens? Really nasty breaks, right? But then you look at the purest bike riders out in, I'll just use a geographical location, Western BC, all of these riders bike up the mountain and then take these unbelievable courses down. So, so people miss that front end piece of it. Now, so it seems seemingly so small, right? But, but that is, that's, that's how it was done. You know, it, uh, it, uh, and so I'm just, you know, I'm just double clicking on your point of like, well, we could use skiing or we could use cycling, you know? Um, well, you know, I, I just, uh, I just saying we can't forget like the base support and all the, you know, building the biology, I guess you can say, and building re the resilience, you know? Uh, has to come there again to mesh with the new cultural acceptance of leg presses and bombing downhill on a bike. Yeah, and I can see that. And I, I think that's a good point. I, you know, part of me wonders though if that very same argument can then, you know, we, we talk about the purest skiers, the purest bikers, but like that itself is evolutionary novel, evolutionarily novel. And I think that's a really interesting question that mm -hmm. um, has come up is take anything you want in our evolutionary history use of fire, cooking, throwing a spear, you know, uh, name what you want. Something at some point was evolutionarily novel, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, and a back squat has far more connection to a human movement pattern of one sort or another than being on a bike. Yeah. Okay? I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't, I don't know of any human evolutionary pattern that has. Any yeah. Well, the, the, well, there, there can be really illegitimate arguments on the timing of those two, but I agree with you. Yeah, I agree. So, a squat uh, pattern, uh, not a not a weighted squat, but a squat pattern. Yeah, squat pattern, right? It, it has some connection to something yes. we as humans have done oh, for way back, way, 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 way back Ooh. in a way in which um, not cycling, not cycling, and even skis, like you know, yeah. getting up the mountain in the first place or having an encounter with snow. Yes, or yes. you know what I mean, like that. Yeah. That's not a you know, depending on where you lived. So I I, I often wonder, and I don't know if you have any thoughts there on. Um, you know, is, is, is there a jump sometimes too quickly from evolutionarily novel to therefore problematic or, or like, how do, how do we parse this out? Right. Because yeah. again, everything we do yeah. was at some point evolutionarily yeah. 
novel. So I don't know mm -hmm. if you have there. Yeah, for sure. Uh, how do we parse this out? I think it goes back to maybe using a mantra I said earlier of, uh, I think it has to come down to intentions and the awareness. And so I think that if that young kid is bombing down the hill, you know, if they, if they intellectually at least discuss these things, that's how I'm saying they pair, they parse out this issue. Do you know what I mean? If they, if they come to the knowledge and understanding, you know, because when they come to the knowledge and understanding that it requires climbing hills, it requires the training to get up there, requires all that strength for mental acuity and capacity. So I don't like, you know, get tired in my mind on the trail and flip over the front wheels. And therefore now my whole three months is lost because of a collarbone that my coach James Fitzgerald is going to be so pissed that I wasn't strong enough to take it. Um, I think if they do that, that builds things like appreciation, gratitude, and I think a connection to how valuable this biological entity is. I think that's what it creates a connection to. So that's how I believe you would parse, parse it is, uh, and, and, um, is, is for is conversation and awareness of it. It's not necessarily just the action of like, ah, you know, it doesn't really matter. Like it's the, the, the lift is obviously available and so is the bike and so is the downhill. You know, it's like, okay, you know, so that's where I think it would be a, a connector. Okay. So having, if I'm understanding you correctly, some uh, understanding and appreciation for the history and the connection to our biology in, in one way or another. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, I think I'm just saying this in a way that probably we've discussed numerous times before in a different angle, but that's what I'm saying, like, why we get to, you know, the conversation of way over here, movement is folly. And then, you know, that's why, and then I just say, well, let's just get on with it. You know, like, do, do you understand it? And everyone's like, yeah, fuck, I understand it. You know, okay, as long as you understand it, <laughs> then let's, let's keep going. Let's move forward. Let's be expressive. Let's be creative. Let's open up the, let's open up the options, you know? Yeah, I, I guess it. I mean, it, it's a good point, but I, I guess it depends on the the context, right? Like in in almost any other context of life where you're taking something seriously, to say something is folly is to be like, well, that's a not worthwhile endeavor. You probably shouldn't be doing that. Um, yeah, yeah, it's the how it, we're it, defining it, folly. Yeah, it, it's a waste of your it's a waste of your time. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Now, if we're saying folly more in the sense of you know creative play expression you know, like uh, doing a high school play or acting class or music or something. That's, that's a different thing. But yeah, the, uh, the initial meeting of the words, like, like, if, if I were to say to someone like, hey, what you're doing over there is folly, but hey, keep on doing it, right? Those, those two are going to be a little bit. In for sure. Yeah, it's yeah. the way I describe folly or the way we can just change a word for it. But if the understanding is there, you know, I think that's where I'm tying into my previous conversation on, you know, you do understand it's movement and these are patterns, right? Okay, great. You do understand that, or you can possibly comprehend like a little bit that we've been doing these patterns for a really long period of time. Oh yeah, I get that. Could you see how these patterns were done differently a long time ago and for this whole time for different reasons? And that this is the, this is the, uh, you know, that's the area where the education needs to occur, right? And then the education occurs. And as I'm saying, let's get over that hump then. And now we're like, okay, so look, look out amongst you, you know, around you. What do you have available for these patterns? And then what are you capable of doing in these patterns? Okay, let's go to it. So that's where I like, I jumped with one word called folly, but you know, it's, it's a, it's a process to, okay. to get to that. Again, that cultural example of the leg press, right. As being a squat pattern. It's like, you're capable of it. It's for you, but you understand, you understand that it's a squat pattern and that, you know, the leg press go back thousands of years to tie in, you know, tie that thing together. And we've been doing this for a long time. Okay. So, yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's helpful. So it's, it's not necessarily a way to um, side swipe or rule out entire classes of movements, but if I'm hearing you correctly, it's a lens through which as we are engaging in the movements we are today, we should have appropriate understanding of the biological and evolutionary history behind them and then kind of use that to maybe form judgments about, um, hey, what, what, what's the best way to go about this project that we're trying to yes. do? Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay.
super helpful. Yeah, listening to you say that sounds better than the way I did, so I agree. <laughs> Um, another interesting question here that I we, we had kind of touched on in our last conversation that I, I wanted to kind of um, come back to is, um, you know, one of the central pieces of evolutionary theory is, um, you know, these notions of survival and reproduction. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things we were saying with um, our previous episode on, on disagreements in fitness, we were talking about uh, Jared Diamond and culture and basically the, the conversation had come up. Um, what about something like books and reading? How, how does that help us? Um, you know, that that's not part of our evolutionary history. Uh, it's not required for survival and reproduction. Um, how does that, it's evolutionary novel, how does, how does that play a role in things? And then you brought up a good point, which is, you know, per, perhaps there is a way in which um, this could be necessary for survival and reproduction because um, you know, clearly since the advent of culture, roughly 10,000 years ago, we've, you know, our species has, uh, grown, uh, pretty dramatically and survived longer periods of time. And I think the interesting question here becomes what exactly do we mean by survival and reproduction? Like, what do those terms mean? Because if all we mean by survival is not dying mm -hmm. and all we mean by reproduction is a child comes out without any reference to how it, you know, was, uh, conceived and, you know, uh, what were the um, environmental factors during the nine months and things like that. Nothing in human history has been more conducive to our survival uh, than all the things that you and I would typically rail against, right? Junk foods, drugs and surgery and technology. Um, and in that light, the past hundred years of human history is a utopia. But of course, if we talk about survival and reproduction in the ways in which you and I would more than likely say like, Hey, it's not just not dying and not being sick. It's living a long, large yeah. life. Um, reproduction isn't just like the baby come out. It's, hey, what was preconception health like and gestational health and, you know, uh, you know, breastfeeding and all, all this other stuff. You know, this is a dystopia. So I, I wonder about that question with regard to like our current fitness practices. And, and if you have any thoughts there about like, what should survival and reproduction mean? And how does that bear on our current fitness and, and health practices? I don't know if you have any thoughts there one way or the other. Yeah, for sure. I, I think about, um, uh, yeah, like you said, the language we use for um, defining each of those inside of fitness. And I think it does tie in is because we use the concepts of the optimal versions of survival and reproduction, let's call it the building of resilience towards the optimal versions, the building of skills towards the optimal versions, like the, the, those building of those skills, um, you know, fitness is a part of the building of the skills, meaning the action of movements, expressing yourself, becoming, you know, creative, building up resilience, building up your ability to navigate the environment, building up your sensors, um, you know, building up all these things through your practice in like physical challenges and like getting tripped up and learning things, et cetera. I think that essentially ends up, you know, uh, giving you uh, an optimal uh, option, <laughs> an optimal version of reproduction and survival. You know what I mean? So it's not, it's not that you say, oh, well, you know, let's get, let's get clamored down on defining what reproduction and what survival means. In my opinion, I don't know if we'll ever get to some agreement on that because no one takes the approach of what's the optimal version of that. It doesn't mean we have to do it. It's just what is the optimal version of that? And then inside of that, I believe, are the practices of basic lifestyle guidelines and, and fitness things that we talk about. Um, it'll end up getting there, right? So it'll end up getting to it doesn't mean that you have to continually reproduce to say, oh, geez, it really worked out well because I reproduced a lot. Um, no, that's not it either. It's that um, uh, let's not let's just not not ask the question. It, are you trying to maximize yourself towards your best reproductive capabilities? So so it is a reproductive. I guess we're building towards reproduction, right? We're building towards the opportunity of these like layman term concepts, healthy, horny, hungry, happy, right? That, but, but that essentially is those things. It's like, 
you're moving to so oh so you're saying we, we should reproduce and uh, i didn't say that i said you gotta it's just an indication that you're you're doing yourself a, a real big service by improving your ability to get to the highest level of that optimized concept of of uh, reproduction on the other lens um i think that's a little bit more of a difficult one so maybe we should sparse it out is that survival mechanisms um, it's a it's a little tougher to to tie fitness inside of that, and you know why is the classic the classic uh, argument of uh, we have these survival mechanisms built inside, so we need to train these survival mechanisms because you know life is hard. It's like well, you know it's a little tougher to look out amongst us now and try to find the tiger and and try to try to think that someone calling you a bad name is really a defense mechanism in which you got to do like six months of training to build up enough resilience to handle that. It's a little tougher to tie that one in. Also knowing that the, the practice of ironically um, doing your fitness practices that you seemingly think you're going to be able to survive anything by doing survival instinct like training actually is futile. <laughs> so that's the irony inside of survival training all the time is that if the intentions are there in which your brain knows you're really not going to protect your house or your children or ward off tigers better by what you do, no matter what you tell yourself, it will lead to your demise, whether it's in a couple of years, five years or et cetera. Because again, we know the tigers are not out there. We know we don't have this impending doom on our home all the time so that's the other one on the survival mode that it's a little tougher to like lean into robbie for where fitness fits into that um but i would say that uh i would start tying the survival conversation more into this um i guess the no not in a reproductive lens but more in a, a resilient lens so maybe survive your lifetime right survive survive the entire experience maybe survival should we should change the language of it and tie in these biological fitness practices to something like sustainability so survival and sustainability as opposed to you know sorry reproduction and sustainability or reproduction and resilience you know things like that because uh survive you know what i'm saying survival has that like oh geez i should do these practices to ensure i can i can ward off all these impending dooms um, but maybe we should focus on the concept of the they're not really massively going to be jamming you up um, and they're not going to come at you all the time, you know, and we have things in place uh, like medicine and clean water, et cetera, that are going to provide a, a great base support for that. Um, and so um, that's what I would say in terms of survival reproduction and how we probably could do a uh, you know, sparse them out and kind of treat them differently and possibly offer a new definition or sorry, new language instead of survival. Yeah, absolutely. Um, side note, do you think we should do like a Bear Grylls episode of uh, fitness and philosophy? I'm up for it. Naked and afraid, they drop us nope. from a helicopter. <laughs> no. I'll do the former. <laughs> yeah, I'll do the former. <laughs> they drop us in the middle of the Sahara Desert and discussing philosophy as we lose more. Um, no, I, I mean, I, th I think these are, yeah, these are good points because it really, it, it, and again, this is where philosophy comes in about, you know, what do these terms mean? Are we equivocating? Because on the basic definition of survival, we are surviving longer. And the reason we're surviving longer is because of, you know, drugs and surgery and all these things that are keeping us not dead longer um or minimizing symptoms longer but of course that's you know like you were saying uh that's not really what we have in mind uh it's more thriving or the optimal version of reproduction or optimal version of um enduring so it's it's not it's not just did you make it to you know 100 years old did you make it to 100 years old with you know good metabolic health and strength and mental clarity and, and things of that nature yeah that's why maybe our language should be instead of reproduction too right it should be vitality and sustainability or vitality and endurance or vitality through consistency let's get masterful and tying them together right vitality through consistency we'll tell you what tell me what you mean well what's your lens well i'm coming from an evolutionary anthropological approach reproduction survival okay i got you you know so 
we can then language it to people based upon where they are, right? So my 15 year old, Hannah, right? Like how would I discuss that with her, right? So for her, it's going to be um, a, a different language than by even vitality and endurance. It's gonna be things like, well, this strength will allow you to practice uh, tennis more frequently, not have any injuries and keep up, you know, your practice with your friends out there hitting balls and enjoying it, you know? Oh, interesting. So what, what, what does it take in order for me to do that? Cause I really like that. Right. So I'm giving it to in her language, but it's still, you know, deep down, it's a survival, right. The way we're discussing it as a, as a language. So, um, yeah, I like that vitality, um, vitality through consistency. I also think it gets to, um, <clears throat> interesting questions surrounding, like from an evolutionary perspective, you know, the collective versus the individual and, you know, um, stuff that, you know, Jared Diamond has, and others have said about agriculture, like, yeah, I wrote that down. Co collectively as a species, agriculture was, again, if we're talking about like near survival and near reproduction, mm -hmm. fantastic, even though we got shorter, weaker, worse teeth, um, you know, some people would argue, you know, patriarchal society, uh, uh, build cities, yeah, build cities, writing all, you know, uh, the, the good and the bad that comes along with culture. And now, we're kind of, I mean, I think it's fairly clear, like we're on the precipice of probably something similar at the moment where it's like collectively for the species, if we just count heads, like just count numbers of people, no question. Mm -hmm. But if we talk about like individual health and resilience and like vitality, like, so it, it's, it's that interesting, um, you know, question. And I think, I think Dawkins talks about this too. Like, what is the, what is the unit of evolution? Is it the, is it the gene? Is it the, you know, is it the collective? Like, what is it that, um, of course this is anthropomorphizing, but that evolution cares about, right? Mm -hmm. Will it, will it take sacrifices at the individual level of vitality for collective, like more numbers? Yes. So, um, and a more effective numbers and more, oh, sorry, you know, effective meaning, um, eye opening, you know, uh, opportunities. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah. yeah, and you know, Zuck, Zuck is the, uh, the leader <laughs> of the future. <laughs> One word, meta. <laughs> Leading us into the metaverse. Oh man. Um, well, we okay. just raised up to 22. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Um, let's see, what else? Um, what else, what else, what else? Uh, well, I like that uh, we hit a couple of things, number of things there, especially like, I like your concept of a lot of things were novel at different times. That's really, that's really good. Um, again, it's still tying in the, you know, appreciating culture, appreciating the current times and how that's tying into, you know, I'm saying these, uh, these experiences. Um, um, can we, I, I'm not sure if, you might be quick with this, but are there some of those biological things that that uh, were not not were, were not really, you know, I guess somewhat. I just thought of pregnancy. You know, it's like um, were there some things that just happen um, that are possible biological experiences that that go way way back. <laughs> that is like, is not like a novel understanding only because they didn't language it or they didn't understand it, if that makes sense. Um, I was trying to think of, like you said, uh, I'm not sure what you used, oh, fire, you know, fire and then yeah. cooking foods. Bipedal walking, use of tools. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, yeah, maybe even walking, you know, could be a, of course, I would love that one, you know, because that's a getting across land and that basic thing of walking in the sun, lifting rocks concept. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think, I think the same point is still going to apply, although you're going to get a lot more history to it. I mean, are we talking like, okay. if, if we're talking just reproduction in general, now if we're talking like reproduction of a cell that goes way back, if we're talking yeah, yeah, no. mammalian reproduction that that is evolutionarily novel at, at some point, if we're talking mm. human bipedal upright, mm -hmm. you know, reproduction and gestation, that's, that's a kind of a new thing too and so yeah i guess it okay. depends where you draw the line yeah no you answered it there um i just thought of like two simple things like uh throwing a spare chopping wood or like 
or punching or something, right? And walking, just two, just two things. Um, and I was just trying to add to the, to the, uh, you know, extensive, uh, who experience we have had with those two simple things, you know, and that's, I was trying to say how far something would go back. If that allows us a little bit more strength in the reductionism towards what we should do every day, you know, that's where I was leading, you know? Yeah. And I mean, I, I absolutely, I mean, we're obviously very much on the same page about like, it, there's, there's some, there's a tremendous amount of weight behind that history. And it's not just like, Oh, an interesting fact that that's our history. Like it, it certainly bears on uh, what we should do today, but I, I've often wondered that, um, you know, about how well at, at, at some point all of these things were evolutionarily novel. And is there anything, there, there may not be, um, is there anything among our practices today or even in the past hundred years that um, is the equivalent of bipedal walking mm -hmm. or, or the use of fire? Is it, is it computers? I, I, I don't know, but it, it's right. something I wonder about where like, it doesn't have the history yet, but then again, everything lacked the history at some point. That's right. So, yeah. um, That's right. interesting question. Um, one other thing I, and I if it's all a simulation, I mean, we just got to have another, another podcast. Yeah. Um, yeah. Elon is, uh, running the simulation. Um, <laughs> he didn't say he was running it. <laughs> he just said we are in it. His, his heart, his heart says he's not, but his brain says he is. That's how he answers it. Probably. Yeah. On his peyote or ayahuasca trip or what have you. <laughs> Um, one other topic I thought we could maybe just briefly discuss or touch on, um, it, it makes total sense now, but I was, I was surprised to see this. It may be at some point as a result of our work, there'll be a separate entry, uh, for fitness in the Stanford encyclopedia of philosophy, but there's an entry for fitness in the Stanford encyclopedia of philosophy. And the re the, the one I'm talking about, there, there are two types, maybe, maybe we can get the physical fitness one in there at some point. Um, is, you know, this concept of evolutionary fitness. And of course, we're doing a podcast called Fitness and Philosophy. And, and these, un unlike uh, other terms like the bank of a river and uh, a bank where you go to deposit your money that have no relation, these two words obviously have a connection. This isn't like an accident. Um, so yeah, I thought we could maybe just uh, talk briefly about this, this notion of uh, evolutionary fitness and its relation to the notion of... Uh, physical fitness, because it's, it's not, I think on one episode, we talked about the etymolo etymological history and it's, it's not that long. Like it's, I mean, the evolutionary concept of fitness is 150, maybe a little bit longer years old and physical fitness, uh, you know, less than that. So yeah, I don't know if you have any thoughts there one way or the other. No, uh, I'm not. And I don't know if it'll take it in the wrong direction, but I think Remember, as I said, with that uh, probably incompetent version of a historical context for it, but that's the way I kind of have looked to the literature to recognize it. It, you know, fitness, fitness was spoke about in a lens of that, like um, the ability to do a task concept, um, which, you know, prior to that was tied into survival and reproduction. I would say in let's, if there was Google searches thousands of years ago, that's the, that's the be like fitness. Oh, uh, you know, that's people who searched for this thing, right? Reproduction survival. And then, and then there was this transitional period, you know, and uh, I'm just trying to think right now, I just because it would seem like a great CNN, you know, five minute bit. Um, I don't think there was a seminal moment, but there was something around, um, you know, uh, recreation, leisure pursuits, expression, creativity, um, and then the recognition that as that like was pressed play in culture, people started recognizing the people that are doing those things. It resulted in, you know, you know, depending upon how you looked at it, uh, an ability to, you know, like it was like a, it was like a pathway towards you discovering more about your potential. Right. So people would sit in the audience watching a dancer. And after 70 years of it, it was like, you know, that what a, what a, you know, I don't, I don't just see them doing crazy stuff. What an unbelievable way to like look at what we're capable of doing. You know, like how fascinating is like the memory I said north of Flagstaff and the, I'm sure they played those games to be like, this is an expression of like, what can I do? Holy fuck, I just kicked that 
basket weave ball like really far <laughs> who could do it the furthest you know it's like, hey, uh. so it starts and then people are in the crowd going oh, okay kicking the ball and then a fifth years later is like fuck that's really fucking cool that they're you know expressing that so i think there was this like i'm not sure what the timeline is you just started on but it, and that kind of that kind of blended into you know i think different areas right like entertainment i.e the classic uh you know, strong man at the circus or like physical feats, right? Uh, the, uh, the experimentation of that in terms of entertainment fashion. Um, as I'm saying that, I'm also thinking about, you know, creative dance and creative expression and gymnastics back in Greek times, right? Where there was like huge, you know, uh, facilities really uh, that people would, you know, oil themselves up with olive oil and wear like, you know, garb that would be not accepted in most fitness facilities today. And they were expressing themselves, right, through wrestling and dance and creative movement and trying to figure out where they are in space. Um, and I'll come back to more current times now. And then you tied in this idea of uh, uh, resilience relative to uh, civilization and improvement of civilization. So, you know, the obvious thing that we'll land on is times of war and the physical manifestations of training and, and robustness and physicality that is inside of that, right? So it, if I'm sure it just took a couple of times for Genghis Khan to look around and be like, <laughs> it's kind of important that we do some of this training and this physical kind of shit in order to do what we need to do, right? So there's probably there's like a huge collection of all of that stuff, but I would agree with you. It's that 150 to 200 years ago, where there was like so many options of that physical expression done in multiple different ways. And then I think, you know, get quickly upon it, you know, and how that ties into today, it just, you know, kind of the, those things, there was more additions added to it. And then of course the, uh, the, the 70s, 60s, 70s revolution of, um, you know, let's call it perception of health and just perception in general. Uh, the advent, advancement of media and technology, um, and it just spliced off then in, you know, in so many different ways. So I don't know if I did anything there or, or just added to kind of my own mental uh, thoughts. No, I mean, I, I, I definitely think that that ties into what we were talking about. I mean, I, I think it goes back to a lot of what we've been talking about today, which is this inherent connection slash tension between biology and culture. There's the, there's the evolutionary fitness side of things, which just means, you know, having some basic level of strength and health and aerobic capacity to be able to like get along in the world. Um, you know, and I'm sure Genghis Khan and others like, Hey, the person who gets winded too easily, not so great. The person who can lift a stone, you know, and take our bags or what have you like, okay. Yeah. So that basic capacity, but then also what you were saying about like, um, you know, the Greeks and kind of the specialization we have today, like this intermixing of culture of like, there's a whole slew of things we don't need to do. We don't need to have a sport solely dedicated to, you know, strongman or Olympic lifting or powerlifting. And yet this is something we feel is interesting to explore and find out what are the limits of this and uh, Ninja Warrior and toe-in surfing and all these all these different things. So this interesting inter interplay between the biological roots of all that stuff, the certain capacities we need to even like get along in the world. And then like, now we have these capabilities, but then we start dicking around and like, oh, what other cool things can we do with them? So, yeah, yeah. And I see, as you were saying that, I just kept hearing physical expression, creativity in movement. That's how I, that's how I, like, that's the things that just get extracted out of the conversation. Um, and that's, I think the tie that binds the whole thing here is the, is probably in your words of, you know, culture versus biology, bio, biological sense and way back evolutionary sense in time. Yeah, it was, it wasn't even, you know, it wasn't even thought about, it wasn't even a thing. It was just done. And now we're in a point where with awareness and knowledge of these things, we're asking questions like, why are we doing any of that stuff? And what we're coming up with with the answers, um, I think thus far with a consensus, we're still really not sure why we're doing those things, hence why we discuss it. And I think that it's still in my language, it's all movement creatively done for the purpose of physical expression. 
And I think that's the thing that would tie it in um, uh, quite possibly of culture and biology, you know, um, it, you know, sure. Again, the, you know, there's, there's numerous ways to do it. There's numerous ways to do it. Um, and I know my biases too. And from my lens, I, I'm trying, I try to, I try to create a reductionist simplest approach because I just see the, the attempts of creating this expression over here with a lot of improper intentions that I know just won't lead to what people think is going to be this higher order version of fitness. So that's why I just go, I just go way back in thought and the examples I use of, uh, you know, walking and lifting rocks in the sun. Um, and I think it should start there and then you build on it, you know? So I'm going to, I'm going to pump, you know, biology as hard as possible and like recognize culture inside of that. And then with education and stuff, I'll grow it uh, with, with an individual over time. Right. But I mean, temporary, Temporarily speaking, in relation to what we were just saying, like culture is the little cherry on top of biology. Yeah, um, yeah, that's yeah. A, yeah, that's what I would that's what I would agree with. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, not that it's not relevant or important, but just no purely in terms of years. Um, yeah, it is a microscopic piece of the puzzle relative to biology. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm so excited, actually, that uh, um, I didn't I didn't read through that, but uh, I'm just looking through the, the fittest individuals are those that are most effective in leaving gametes to the next generation, it appears. Therefore, the evolutionary theory requires definition that will protect the charges of totality. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just love reading through that. Oh, yeah, it's a, it's a great quote. I mean, basically, yeah, so one of the um one of the super interesting questions within biology is like how do you how do you define fitness in such a way that isn't tautological yeah. you know and the basic thing is like what well, you're saying the most you know the fittest are the ones that survive but of course the way you catch that is like who's left at the end and then that yeah. kind of circles back on itself so yeah um, well to use that circle back on itself um people could go back to our first episode because we discuss this in our first episode well what are we defining as fitness and we laid out the how it's moved from just a task reproduction survival is included in it you know work capacity you know modal something domains something 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 i don't know how long it's going to take but i'm in for the 20 mile march here i'm going to add a additional goal to what we're doing here i, I let's see if we can get uh physical fitness entry into the stanford encyclopedia oh man i was so excited even when you mentioned that what a great what a great uh proposition that would be really cool because they've really got cool. evolutionary fitness now but let's see if we can get philosophy of physical fitness cool. yeah yeah i don't know i think it's achievable we all have to have audacious goals even this podcast and you and i do you know so yeah maybe that's what our long-term uh indirect goal will be yeah. a beacon of sort any final thoughts on uh, evolution? Uh, no, let's let's hash back. Um, it, it should be obvious uh, to those listening that um, it's important that you at least consider the education of it for yourself and for how it plays a role in fitness. Um, I hope also that you see how big in and uh hairy but uh but also i was trying to think of something as an analogy of what's big and hairy that you want to spend a lot of time with <laughs> um <laughs> what's big and direction. hairy you'd like to spend a lot of time with i don't know big dog yeah big dog that's true right it's true yeah big dog um you know you, you want to you want to just recognize it's big and we tried to make it fairly simple as some of the pieces we talked about. I think, I think we did a good job of it. Um, and I think we did hit the things that I mentioned from the start we would going to try to do. Um, what are we discussing today? Defining those two things. And how does it tie into fitness for coaches and just people that are, that are considering it? And I think we hit on some points that people could take out of it that uh, they could go on their own and, and contemplate on. 
And if you got any, uh, any thoughts or additions that you'd like us to open up more on, then don't hesitate to let us know. Yeah, please. Next week, the metaverse. <laughs> Is that meta metaverse and fitness? Oh boy. Metaverse. And what do you do when you, uh, yeah, I, I was thinking about that as we were talking about like, what do you do when you're moving in the metaverse, but you're not moving in the real? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure there'll be uh, some tie-in to, uh, like, we'll go back to some old research of the, uh, you know, it's the things that we would never thought we'd glean from the visualization research, you know, because some of the visualization research, you know, had a lot of biological, physical markers associated with the, vi with the visualization research. I obviously classic sitting on a chair, closing your eyes let's set you up to all these physiological phenomena testing and you're just sitting there, you know? So just imagine all the repetitions of that F1 drivers, you know, mixed mole athletes prior to competition, jumping on stage in front of 10,000 people with your basu or is a basu an instrument? I think it's an instrument. I think it's a ball, basu ball. Well, sure. Maybe you're doing oh, okay. tricks on stage. I thought you were talking about a, a bassoon. Like the, bassoon, uh, I was. Okay. I was actually, and then I called it a bassoon. Anyways, I apologize for the bassoon, bassoonists out there. Um, you know, so that's why I think will be fascinating is, uh, and I'd like to discuss it with you, is the repercussions of thinking you're actually doing, actually having some mimetic response, like a physiological response from that particular thing through visualization, but you're actually not doing it. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess the questions there come, you know, are you improving all the characteristics of fitness? If physiologically you might have some of those pieces, you know, thermoregulation, heart rate, et cetera, but you're actually not participating. Yeah. Absolutely. No, oh, man. <laughs> what a world. What a world. Yeah. Living. Right. Right. So uh, thank you. It was uh, really helpful. Uh, I love the topic. Um, I think we see this every time, maybe not every time, but this, this actually could be uh, an area which, because I know there's some podcasts called this, but they really don't go this direction um, of uh, evolutionary fitness. Like a, you know, everything inside of it is all connected to that. You know, and it doesn't have a classic philosophical tone of asking the questions throughout. It's, it's just like the whole, all the podcasts are dedicated to, to that. There's, lo there's lots in there. Yeah, like what would it even look like and what would be the details of it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All righty. Thanks so much. All right. See you next you. time. See you next time.